In July 1963, Walt met Alan for the first time. In November, Alan moved away. Five months of unexpected friendship. Walt and Esther had just settled into St. Anthony's after nearly 13 years of pastoring at Selby, which had been their first church, their first home. It was where they had left little faith. Leaving had been hard. All those friends and memories and that tiny grave, an hour's drive away now. They promised each other that they'd go and visit but Esther was teaching all week, and Walt was busy on Sundays, and Saturdays had a way of filling up. Walt worried that the little plaque on the ground might get lost in the grass or stepped on or broken or something. He'd lie awake at night worrying about that. But one of the things that Walt loved about St. Anthony's was the soup kitchen an actual soup kitchen. Selby's, Selby had been a, a small town, so there didn't seem to be a need for a soup kitchen, but this was an actual city and it was a completely different world. So every Tuesday, the basement came to life. It was the usual church basement with a cement floor and walls that had been white at one point stacking chairs and tables that made noise when everybody moved them, and uh, a whiff of bleach and a whiff of floor polish. And at one end of the room, there was a pass-through where the ladies of the kitchen cabal, as Walt came to think of them, ladled out bowls of something steaming and wonderful with home-baked home biscuits and a small paper plate of this week's salad Caesar, coleslaw, fresh fruit. Serving started at noon sharp, but uh, the doors were open an hour before. Because, you know, in, in the summer, the basement was cooler than out on the sidewalk, and in the winter it was warmer, and the men would be waiting anyway, so they might as well wait inside. The ladies of the kitchen cabal, they loved with a fierce, fierce love. The kind of love that would wrap your knuckles as soon as give you a hug, but only if it was for your own good. If they didn't care, they'd just let you act any old way you pleased, but you were better than that. And you were going to live up to your potential. So the line formed neatly to the right and moved neatly past the window. No teasing, no sass, no swearing, just a please and a thank you very much, ma'am. Walt's job in all this was to show up wearing his collar and to say the prayer. Alan was one of the men in his 60s, like so many of them. He was clean and he was rumpled with that scruffy uniqueness. But uh, Alan did not arrive early, like everybody else. He did not stand in line. He arrived at 11.59.59, walked straight to the counter with his eyes down. He put a Tupperware container on the pass-through counter. The captain of the kitchen cabal, Mrs. Abernathy, said, Good morning, Alan. Morning, ma'am. She filled his container with soup and put it in a paper bag with a biscuit and handed it back. And Alan said, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome, Alan. We'll see you next week. He nodded and he left. Walt asked Mrs. Abernathy what it was all about. And she said she didn't know for sure, but about six months ago, Alan had come in for soup and a biscuit, but he was very uncomfortable and he insisted, I need to eat at home. I need to eat at home. Which had thrown everybody in the kitchen for a loop, but they found a container, that container, 
and uh, at a lid and, and a bag and away he went. He never stayed. He never made eye contact. He never talked to anyone except Mrs. Abernathy. So the next week, Walt, being Walt, stationed himself at the door. And as Alan was leaving with his paper bag, Walt just said, hi, you're Alan, right? My name's Walt. Morning, Reverend. Okay, well, we'll see you next week, right? Next week. And the next few Tuesdays went the same. Walt said hi. Alan said hi, back with his eyes down, nodding, and he'd leave. And then after a while, Walt decided to take a chance and ask Alan if he would stay for lunch. They could eat together. Uh, no, no, no. I, I need to eat at home. Oh, okay, if you're sure. Alan took one step towards the door and he said, at home, Reverend. Walt realized that this was an invitation. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, just wait right here. I'm going to go get some soup. I'll be right back. Alan nodded. Mrs. Abernathy gave Walt a very approving smile and another takeout container, and he followed Alan out the door. The two men walked a couple of blocks without talking and down an alley and up a flight of iron stairs. Walt waited while Alan pulled out a key and unlocked the door at the top, and Walt ducked through after his host, <laughs> wondering what on earth he'd been thinking. Alan's place was one room. Cracked plaster, water stains, but tidy and clean. There were no two things in the room that matched, except for the poppies. Alan cleared some socks off the couch and, and gestured for Walt to sit. Alan took the kitchen chair by the window and he reached behind himself and took a spoon, a couple of spoons off the sill. He looked carefully at them both and breathed on one, <sighs> polished it on his sleeve, checked it again in the sunlight and handed it to Walt. Walt decided, what the heck? He said, thank you. He took the spoon and he dug into his lunch. He looked around the room uh, just for something, for anything to talk about, but there were no books, there were no newspapers, there were no magazines, just a small TV and a radio and a toaster. On the wall above the toaster, beside the poppies, there was a picture of a young girl with blonde pigtails and a gap-tooth smile, and the picture looked at least 20 years old. Alan, um, who's the little girl in the picture? My daughter. Oh, really? Yeah. What's her name? Lorna. Lorna from my mom. She lives out west. Um, she said she's going to send for me. I'm going to see her soon, and she's going to send for me, she said. Oh, uh, well, that sounds like it'll be really nice. Uh, yeah, she's going to send for me, she said. When did you see her last? 1952. And he went back to eating his soup. 11 years. Walt could not imagine it. He looked at the picture. Imagine having a daughter and not seeing her for 11 years and hoping that maybe someday she'd send for him. He realized Alan had said something and he'd missed it. Um, pardon? You got kids, Reverend? 
Uh, no, not. Uh, we we had a little girl. Sorry, sorry, not not my business. No, no, it's it's just. Nobody ever asks, so I never talk about it, about her. Faith. Her name was Faith. Her name was Faith. I'm sorry, Reverend. Thanks, Alan. More silence and soup. There was nothing left to ask about except the poppies. You know, those little ones that they hand out on Remembrance Day. Alan had a piece of cardboard, about four feet square, tacked to the wall, and it was covered with poppies, dozens of them. Walt said, well, that's quite a collection, Alan. Alan glanced over at it and back down. Uh-huh. How many of them are there? Seventy-three. Wow. Um, where did you get them all? I found them. People, people just lose them. They shouldn't, they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't just lose them because they mean something. They're sad. They're hopeful. Are you a, a veteran, Alan? W W one, M E N. Walt said. W.W. 2. Rimini. Alan looked up, and for the first time, Walt saw that he had blue eyes. Yeah? Walt said, yeah. And they talked. They talked and talked. They talked about battles and commanders and places and friends listening and learning each other's wars. And the next week they did it again and again and again. Alan would come for his soup and they would walk together silent until Alan was home and they'd eat together and understand each other. Being a soldier, being a father, Walt really started looking forward to these lunches. When November rolled around, Walt found himself picking up lost poppies off the ground and putting them in his pocket because they were sad and they were hopeful. He and Esther took a week off and went back to Selby and they installed a proper gravestone for Faith engraved with a poppy because it was sad and hopeful. The next week, Walt was back at the soup kitchen, but Alan didn't show. So Walt walked out and climbed the staircase at the end of the alley and knocked on the door. A woman answered. She was cleaning it, getting the place ready for the next tenant. Alan was gone. No, didn't leave a forwarding address. He didn't owe her any money, so she didn't ask. No, he didn't leave any notes. He couldn't write. Walt turned to go. Well, wait a minute, though, she said. She went inside and came back. This was on the windowsill. I don't know, maybe it's for you. She handed him a paper bag. Down in the alley, Walt opened it and inside there was a Tupperware container and a poppy. Walt held the flower for a moment, twirling the pin in his fingers. The only thing he could hope was that Alan's daughter had sent for him, after all, which made him sad that it would have taken so long and happy that it had finally happened and hopeful that it would turn out all right. He smiled. He stuck the poppy in his lapel and he thanked God for Alan.